Hey, Wave Church family and friends, welcome to Wave Church Online. I'm Pastor Jason, the lead pastor here at Wave. Hey, if this is your first time joining us at Wave Online, let me give you a warm welcome. You are in for a treat today. If you are new, let me show you around a little bit on our website. Just below, you'll find a couple resources there. You'll find a communication card where you can simply fill that out and mark, I'm new, and we'll send you an email welcoming you to Wave Church. You'll also find the outline for our sermon today and a life group guide. I also want to point you over to our Wave Church app. We have an app that we use here at Wave, and on there, you'll actually find some great resources that we're giving our Wave Church family in 2021. Right now, we're in an incredible series called Pray First. What if we began this year praying first as we head into 2021? And so we've given you a prayer guide along with a Bible reading plan. Family, I love you you. I play blessings over your home today. Let's get into God's Word. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, is my song. Cause you are good, you're good.
Hey everyone, welcome to Wave Church SD. My name is Stephen Perez and I'm the family pastor here at Wave. Uh, and I'm so honored to be with you today. You know, we've been through a lot uh, in this past week. The events that have unfolded over the past few days have probably left you with a lot of questions. Uh, maybe feeling confused or angry and, and frustrated and wondering why and, and how. And I just want to pause and encourage you for a moment that this is a great place to be to be right here, to be in the midst of all the chaos in front of God's Word. And it's my hope and it is my prayer that today you will encounter the words of God and that it will bring wisdom and comfort and encouragement into your life. But before we start, will you join me in a word of prayer? God, we come before you right now just in complete recognition of our great need, aware that we are broken aware that we are sinful, aware that we are in need of you to save us. And so, God, we ask you today to speak to us, to bring healing to our hearts, to bring conviction in places where we need to be convicted. And, God, that you will continue to guide us and shape us and mold us into the people that you desire us to be. God, may you tune our hearts to the words that you have for us this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I'm an individual that doesn't really believe in coincidence. Uh, I tend to see a lot of connections between things. And, well, if you've uh, been on earth long enough, you probably know that this could be a really exhausting exercise because there's a lot of things out there that are just difficult to explain. They're hard to make sense of. But when Jason told me back in the fall that we would be starting the new year off with a sermon series on prayer, I really didn't think much of it. I thought, yeah, that would be great. It's a good way to start the year, and prayer is always a good thing to talk about. But as I sat down to write this message, I realized that there was so much wisdom that God had given to us, that there was so much providence that God had given to us. You see, I wrote this message before everything that happened, before the insurrection took place at the Capitol, before people came and tried to intimidate and undermine our democracy. And as I watched the events unfold throughout the day, I called Jason and said, man, I don't know if I have the right message. I think, I think we might need to do something different. And Jason encouraged me because he had heard the message already. He said, why don't you just go back and, and read through what you already have written again? And so I did. And as I, as I read through them in context of all that has happened, I realized that God had prepared this message for us before I had any understanding of what we really needed and what was going to be happening around us. And my hope for today is that we get a better understanding of prayer that we could really dive in and understand just how important it is that prayer becomes a core part, a central part of our daily experience. You see, prayer is something that many Christians struggle with. It's true. It, it's not an, an indictment. It's just a fact. You see, our interaction with prayer tends to take place on the far ends of the spectrum. And to illustrate this, I want to share two personal stories from my life about prayer. The first one uh, comes from my grandmother, my nana. Every morning, I remember waking up and watching her start her day off in prayer. I would walk by her bedroom and I would see her knelt on her knees over her bed, praying and starting the day off with 30, 40 minutes of prayer. And every night when she would tuck us in, she would pause and she would pray with us. She was committed. She had a time, uh, she had a place, and she had a plan. I've always admired her active prayer life. She's one of those people that when she says, I will be praying for you or I will be praying for that, you know it's true. You know it's going to happen. You know you're going to be prayed for. And the second story of prayer actually comes from my wife. You know, Haley and I like to uh, laugh, and we often laugh about this story that she tells about when she first came to Christ. When she first came to Christ, she, she prayed and said, God, I, I want to follow you. I want to give my life to you. I, I love you. I want to do anything for you. But please, 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 God, don't make me into a missionary, and don't make me marry a pastor. Those people are weird. Well, she learned a valuable lesson that day, right? She learned, be careful what you pray for, or in her case, what you pray against, because she's 0 for 2. 
But these two stories give us the bookends of what we think about when it comes to prayer. It's either this all-out devotion on our knees praying earnestly, or it tends to be a, a quick, please God, anything but that. When we view prayer through these bookends of all in or, or quick and in the moment, we tend to get down on ourselves, right? We tend to belittle ourselves for, for not being devout enough, for not praying enough. Or we simply stay on that quick and, and you know, very impromptu prayer cycle, and we never really go deep. And I hope that we can break these bookends and find a better rhythm, find a better intentionality behind our prayer life. And to do that, we're going to take a look at the tabernacle prayer. Now, if you're going through our prayer first guide this week, you will be learning all about the different elements of the tabernacle and how they provide a model for us and how we can pray. Um, but one of my pet peeves is when you go to a conference or a training and the presenter just reads from the PowerPoint, right? They don't give you any additional, they literally just read word for word from the PowerPoint. So I, I don't want to do that today. You could check the prayer first guide. I encourage you, go do it. There's awesome content in there, really good prayers, really good devotionals in there. And you'll get a lot of information about the tabernacle and all of the different elements that were there. Uh, what I want to do today is I want to go in a little bit different direction. I want to pay attention to the significance of the tabernacle to Jewish life and how the tabernacle teaches us about our practice of prayer today in 2021. Um, for those of you who don't know what the tabernacle is, what I'm talking about, it is simply the, the portable house of worship that housed the presence of God. It was basically a big tent uh, that sat in the middle of the camp of Israel, and it's where people would go to pray and make sacrifices. Uh, the tabernacle was often referred to as the tent of meetings. It was the place where the Israelites would go to meet God. And this leads to our first point this morning. Prayer ushers us into the presence of God. Prayer is a time where we go to meet with God. You know, when I work with kids in children's ministry, I often explain to them that prayer uh, is simply a time where we pause and we talk to God. And that's why we, we close our eyes and we clasp our hands and we bow our heads because we're trying to focus our attention on God and not be distracted by all that's going on around us. It's kind of like when we uh, go out to dinner with a good friend and we put our cell phone away, right? We don't want to be distracted. We want to focus on the relationship. And that's exactly what prayer is. And, and generally, our, our interaction with prayer is usually asking God to show up at a specific time and place. Usually, we sit down and we pray and we say, God, please be with me in that meeting. Or God, please be with that person as they go in for that operation. Or God, please show up and help me with that test or help me with that exam or help me with this project, right? But really, prayer is a time where we intentionally enter into the presence of God in that very moment. You know, for the Israelites, they knew that when they went to the tabernacle, they were going into the presence of God they were going to enter into the presence of the Lord. Likewise, when we pray, we are entering into the presence of the Lord. In the tabernacle, there was a, a veil. It was inside the tent, and it was a veil, and behind that veil was called the Holy of Holies. That's where the, the actual presence of the Lord, or the Spirit of the Lord was, and there was this big veil that separated the Spirit of God from the people. And when uh, the temple was constructed, this veil made its way into the temple. The temple was kind of like the tabernacle, but it was an actual building. It wasn't a tent. It was a permanent structure. And th this veil made its way over into the temple. But when Jesus was crucified, we're told that that veil tore from top to bottom. It was torn in two, separated. Matthew 27 tells us, and when Jesus had cried out again and in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The moment Jesus completed his self-sacrifice on the cross, God's presence was released into the world. That means wherever you are, you are actually able to enter into the presence of God. The Holy of Holies is no longer behind the veil. It is released into the world. That means every time we pray, we are actually entering into the presence of God. 
And it is important that we understand this because when we do, it changes how we pray. It changes the entire experience that we have. We are not simply praying for a future experience with God. We're not simply hoping that God will show up, but we're acknowledging that He's already there, that He's here now, and that we could be present with Him now. In this very moment, even as I speak with you through the screen, God wants to be with you. You know, we are at this stage with my kids where we really want them to, to know and to understand that how they ask for things and how they say things matters, right? We encourage them. We say, speak in full sentences and say, please and thank you. And for the most part, they do a, a really good job with this. But there's one thing that I've noticed, that if they're in uh, another room playing with toys or if they're watching a show, uh, they tend to talk to us a little bit different. We get more of the, mom, water or dad, snack, right? But when I come near, when I enter the room, when I'm physically present with them, the way they speak changes, right? Then all of a sudden, when they, they see dad face to face, they go, oh, uh, dad, can I please have a snack? Mom, may I please have some water? How much more would our prayer life change if we realize that when we pray, it is not to a distracted father in another room, but to a, an engaged God? who wants to hear from you, who is attentive to all that you have to say. Secondly, the tabernacle teaches us that God is at the center of all that we do. God is at the center of all that we do. You know, the tabernacle itself was at the center of the entire Jewish encampment. We're told this in Numbers chapter 2, starting in verse 17. It says that the tent of the meeting and the camp of the Levites will set out in the middle of the camps. That is to say, they will set out in the middle of all the tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel would camp out around the tabernacle. All of Jewish life was oriented around the tabernacle. It's where people would meet. It's where daily prayers would take place. The smoke that would arise from the burning of incense and sacrifices would actually rise into the air and people would be able to navigate themselves around uh, the encampments by centering themselves on the tabernacle. There were specific celebrations and rituals that would take place in the tabernacle. Celebrations that were meant to encourage and bring hope and joy. Rituals that remind them of their, of their difficult past and how God had provided. There were rituals to forgive specific sins or to ask for specific providence. There were festivals and, uh, uh, for harvest and gathering and, and seasons. The tabernacle continually pulled people back to prayer and back to the presence of God. All aspects of life were acknowledged in the tabernacle. It was the hub of all that they did. The good, the bad, the happy, the sad, the pretty, the ugly, it all took place at the tabernacle, in a similar vein, our prayer life should be about all that we experience in life. Not just the, the sad things, not just the happy things, not just the hopes, not just the desires. All aspects of life should be brought to God in prayer. In James chapter 5, it tells us this. It says, is anyone among you in trouble? Are you going through some difficulty? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Do you have something to rejoice over? Let them sing songs of praise. That is to say, pray. Is anyone among you sick? Are there some health concerns? Let them call the elders of the church over to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Part of developing a healthy prayer life is it needs to be attached to all that we do. It needs to be the center of all that we do. We need to become practiced at not only entering into the presence of God at a set time and place or whenever we think about it, but entering into the presence of God again and again and making Him the center of all that we do. He needs to be the center of our, of our work lives, of our family lives, of our friendships, of our politics, of our physical life, of our emotional life, of our mental life. It all needs to have God at the center. Jesus put it this way. He said, love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Everything we do needs to orbit around the Lord. You know, one of the many unfortunate things that we saw in this past week 
Was the name of Jesus being invoked in the midst of the insurrection? Individuals were holding Bibles in the air while encouraging people to fight with police and, and throw punches and hit with sticks. There were flags with the cross on it that were being waved back and forth while people chanted obscenities and mocked reporters. It was really, really difficult to watch. You know, the dissonance is not only alarming, but it also tends to elicit a little bit of anger and fury in me as well. How does this happen? How do individuals conflate violent actions with Jesus and the gospel? How do you get there? I think it happens when we get disconnected, decentered from God. And it happens all the time, right? This isn't the first time this has happened. It happens all over the world. It's happened all throughout history. And I believe it happens because we, we can't simply make Jesus an accessory to our lives, right? It happens when we don't make Jesus the center, but simply just a part. He's just a part of what I do. And other things become the center. And we can't just sprinkle Jesus on top of what we want to do. We've got to choose to follow God. I think of the prayer that we learned last week, the Our Father, God, your will be done. God, your kingdom come. You know, John gave us a warning about what happens when we stop making Jesus the center of our lives. In 1 John 2, he said, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. What struck me most in the photos that I saw and articles over the past week was the lustfulness and the rage in the eyes of the rioters. The, there was a smugness and pride about their actions that you saw on their faces. You know, it's, it's easy to look at them and to be angry and judge them, but their actions should also serve as a warning to us all. That when we get decentered from Christ, the things of this world become our center. When we become disconnected from God, we will center our lives on other things. Now, this doesn't mean that if you don't pray or if you don't go to church that you're going to go destroy federal buildings. But in your own way, lustfulness and pride will start to play out. For those who sieged the Capitol building, their lives became centered around politics, conspiracy theories, and personal power. And we see just how destructive it is when we become disconnected from God. Family, in this season, we need people who are genuinely centered on Christ. We need to be in His presence daily, allowing Him to center us and guide us because people now, more so than ever before, need to know what the truth is. They need clarity, and as believers, we are called to be a light in a dark world. We are called to guide people back to their Creator, back to their Savior, because He's the only one that can fulfill them, that can heal them, that can bring them the peace that they are looking for. We need people, we need to be believers, we need to be a people who will lead others to Jesus. Not the politics, not the policies, not to other people, not to the things of this world. We need to be people who lead others to their Savior, to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And thirdly, the tabernacle teaches us that we need to slow down. You know, I tend to run through life at a, a really fast pace. Um, I was able to take some time off between Christmas and the New Year's, and honestly, most of that time off I just spent uh, exhausted. Um, in the three weeks leading up to Christmas, I had over 60 hours of counseling. I moved into a new house. I shopped for Christmas presents. I wrapped Christmas presents, put Christmas presents under the tree. We decorated the new house for Christmas. I wrote a sermon. I helped plan a Christmas Eve service. Um, I helped plan an online virtual piano recital. I built a trampoline. I hosted at a virtual Christmas party with over a dozen elementary age kids, and I changed the oil in our two cars. Are you exhausted? 
I'm exhausted just saying all that. And, and I don't say it to brag. I actually say it as a confession. It's too much. It's not sustainable. I can't run at that pace. But this is true for so many of us, isn't it? My story isn't unique. So many of us, we get so familiar with overextending ourselves that we start to think that it's normal. You see, the tabernacle and the customs and rituals that went into it forced the Israelites to slow down. Stop and think about finding an animal, bringing it to the tabernacle. You'd have to wrestle it on down there. Sacrificing that animal, putting it on the altar, watching it burn, cleaning yourself in the basin of water so that you could be made clean, lighting candles and incense, praying, it would have taken hours. It would have taken a long time, a large chunk of time. The tabernacle was a way of forcibly slowing the Israelites down. Why? So that they could spend time where it mattered most. So that they could spend time with the Lord instead of being distracted by all that there is to do. If we are going to develop a healthy prayer life, we need to learn to slow down and be intentional in our prayer life. When we rush through life, we miss out on the presence of God in our life. And it often leads to us feeling really disconnected. And I want to take us to a section of scripture that I think highlights just how so many of us operate. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go towards the very front. We're going to go to Genesis and look at the story of Jacob and Esau. This is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. And if you aren't familiar, familiar I'll give you a quick rundown um, of this story. Esau is the older brother. He's a manly man. He hunts. He's hairy. Seriously, the Bible tells us that. I'm not embellishing. It says he's a hairy guy. Uh, and Jacob is the younger brother, right? He's the cute younger brother who's doted on by his mother. And long story short, Jacob, this younger brother... Uh, steals his brother's blessings and inheritance by impersonating Esau and tricking their old blind and dying father. Needless to say, Esau isn't happy about it, and Jacob decides, you know what, uh, I should probably get out of here. And so he does. He flees, he leads, and he starts a life somewhere else. You know, he, and he goes, and he, he does start a good life, and he falls in love, and he gets married. Well, technically twice into sisters, but that's a whole different story. But he has a family, he has livestock, and by all measures, a very successful life. And after 20 years, he finally decides, I think it's time for me to go home. All right, I think it's time to make amends. And so he decides to send word to his brother, I'm, I'm, I'm coming home. Right? And the messengers come back and they say, Hey, Jacob, Esau is coming to meet you, actually. He's excited. He can't wait to see you. And oh, by the way, Esau has 400 men with him. When Jacob hears this, he starts to freak out. He starts thinking, 400 men? That's an army. There's an army of people coming. Esau's coming to destroy me. He's coming to take everything I have. And so Jacob does what I think all of us here would probably do. He starts planning, right? He starts divvying up his stuff and putting it into different camps. He creates different waves of servants to go out before him to greet Esau to see if they could really find out what his intentions are and how angry he is so that maybe one of those servants can escape, run back to Jacob, let him know Esau's really angry, he's going to kill you, and then Jacob might be able to flee with his wives and children and enough provisions to survive. It would have been a really hectic day to get all of this planned. And we've all had one of those, right? We've all had one of those moments where everything goes wrong, where it's all hands on deck, and we're just trying to find some solutions to some problems, to stop the leaking, right? Jacob was probably anxious, worried, fearful, trying to make decisions. And as nightfall came, Jacob finds himself all alone, probably for the first time that day. And this is what the scriptures tell us, starting in Genesis 32, verse 24. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? 
Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. The man that wrestled with Jacob, many Bible scholars believe that that was Jesus. That that was God coming down to meet with Jacob at a moment in need. It was a, a, a Christ-like figure uh, that we see throughout the Old Testament in different scenarios. But Jacob was running so fast through the day. He was running so fast through life, making plans and decisions and plotting and planning to protect all that he has, that when God showed up, he didn't even recognize him. In his anxiousness, and his tiredness, he doesn't recognize that it is God who is right there with him. And he fights with God all through the night. And you might be thinking, well, how is he supposed to know that it was God who showed up? And how was he supposed to know that it wasn't maybe an actual bad guy? Because God had been showing up for Jacob all throughout his life. This wasn't the first time that God had tried to speak to Jacob, that God had tried to encourage him, that God had shown up in Jacob's life. But Jacob is running so fast through life that he misses out on what could have been a night where the Lord brought him peace and comfort and rest, where he was reassured. And guess what? All that stressing out that Jacob was doing, it was pointless. Esau didn't want to come and kill him. Esau didn't want to hurt him. Esau was just so excited to see his brother again after 20 years. He was so excited to show Jacob all that he had accomplished. He had 400 people to his name. He wanted to show that he was doing well in his life too. Have you been there before? Where you were just so stressed out that you can't even hear the voice of God? It might be time to slow down. Three points. I want to make as we close up from this story. The first point, the pain has a purpose. Jacob's unwillingness to relent and let go causes God to dislocate his hip. He walked with the limp for the rest of his life, but this limp served as a reminder that God was with him, that one of the most stressful moments of his life did not take place alone, but with God in his presence. And this limp, it forced Jacob to live differently. He was no longer able to simply run away from his problems because he wasn't fast anymore. But rather, he had to learn to address them. The pain of that interaction, it, it stuck with him for life, but it had such positive implications. Family, this past year has maimed a lot of us. We've all been hurt. We're all walking with the limp. Maybe a financial limp or an emotional limp or a, a physical limp from our health. We are walking wounded and we carry the scars of some serious life battles over this past year. But these painful moments, they often force us to slow down, to look at life and see God in the midst of all that is going on. To see that we actually need Him to be there with us, that we can't do it alone. These scars that we carry, they're not reminders of our failures, but reminders of God's faithfulness to continue to pursue you and provide for you. Paul understood this clearly in his own life. In 2 Corinthians 12, he tells us, But he, Jesus, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, and in insults, and hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The second point I want to make keep wrestling. Keep wrestling. The second thing I want us to take away from this story is that sometimes we need to keep wrestling. You know, in Hosea, we get a little commentary on this section of scripture that we don't get uh, from Genesis. In Hosea chapter 12, verse 4, it says that Jacob strove with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. Jacob's demand to be blessed came with tears in his eyes. It came knowing he was defeated, knowing that he lost, and yet somehow still asking God to bless him, still believing that in some way God could use his defeat for good. As we seek to develop 
a life of prayer, sometimes the best thing we can do is just keep wrestling through it. You see, Jacob's prayer doesn't come when he gets his life together. It doesn't come when he gets organized and realizes, man, I need to to slow down. I need to have a, a time, a place, and a plan, and I really need to commit to prayer. It comes immediately. It comes in a moment of wrestling. So if you're looking to start a life of prayer, start right now. You don't need to wait to get everything perfect. It's not like uh, making a New Year's resolution and say, oh, well, I'll start eating healthy in a week. Let me just get rid of all the junk food first. You could start now. Start praying now. Don't wait. There's no need. And if you've already started to pray this year, maybe you've been praying throughout this year and you're wondering, is this really working? Is this doing anything? Is it getting me anywhere? Keep wrestling through it. God is with you in that struggle. And when it feels like all is lost and and, and defeat is imminent and your eyes are filled with tears, just simply hold on because God is there and he wants to bless you. And finally, our last point is let God rule. Did you catch the name change that took place in this section of Scripture? God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. Jacob meant the deceiver. And that's just what Jacob was. He was a deceiver. He deceived his brother. He deceived his father. He even deceived himself. And he even got deceived throughout his life. But after this encounter with God, after wrestling with him, Jacob gets a new identity. He gets a new name. And that name is Israel. And Israel translates to, well, wrestles with God, right? Contends with God. But Hebrew is a really unique language because sometimes the verb and the subject changed place. So Israel not only is a descriptor of what Jacob did on that night when he thought he was all alone, it also means that God contends, that God wrestles, that God fights, that God rules, that God is in charge. What Jacob received on that night was a constant reminder that he was not alone was a constant reminder that God was going before him and making a way and contending for him on his behalf. And the same is true for me and you and for all of us today. God is not looking for us to be perfect and have it all together. He is simply looking for us to come to him, to show up, to be present with him, to speak to him, to pray with him, even when we aren't sure what to say. And I love this this scripture that tells us that even when we don't know what to pray, but we just come to God, this is what the scriptures tell us happens when we don't know what to pray. In Romans 8, it tells us likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So when you don't have the words, God has them for you. He's just asking you to show up. Building a life of prayer isn't about having perfect words. It's more than just having a perfect place and a perfect plan. Building a life of prayer is about continually reminding ourselves that God is in control, that He rules, that He contends, that He will contend on our behalf. Even when you don't know what to say, God does. And God will show up on your behalf. As you spend time this week reading through the prayer first guide and learning about the different elements of the tabernacle and how they point us back to Jesus, I want to remind you of this truth that comes to us from Hebrews chapter 9. It says, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Family, remember who it is that we pray to. We pray to a God who came down, who took on human form, who lived a life free of sin, but full of love and grace and power and healing. We pray to a God who willingly went to the cross on our behalf to take the punishment that we deserve. We pray to a God who who died on that cross, but in his greatness, in his holiness, death could not contain him. We pray to a God who rose from the grave and reigns forever 
and ever. We pray to a God that is a more perfect tabernacle. His ways are not of this world, but it is only His way that will lead us to a life of freedom. It is only He that will lead us to eternal life. There is no institution, there is no politician, there is no political party that can do what Jesus has already done for us. So we remember who we pray to. We pray to a God who wants to meet with you, who wants to be in your presence. We pray to a God that wants to be the center of all that we do. He wants to be with you in the highs and the lows and the good and the bad. We pray to a God who makes it possible for us to slow down, to a God who graciously redeems our painful moments and gives them purpose. We pray to a God who wrestles with us and for us and who is reigning and ruling right now in this very moment. So I want to ask you to simply close your eyes, bow your heads, and in this moment, join me as we acknowledge his presence with us today. Let's close in prayer. God, we are so grateful for you. God, that you are with us right now. As we watch on our screens, as we sit on our couch or in our chair, wherever it is we might find ourselves, that you are with us. God, may we feel your presence embrace us in this moment. God, may you calm the worries and the anxieties and the fears in our mind. May you pull our hearts back towards you. God, there's so much out there that is vying for our attention, that is pulling us in ways that are opposite of your will. And God, we ask for forgiveness for the things that we have done that have sinned against you. And God, we ask for you to wrestle with us and for us, God, to pull us back into your will, to center us around you. God, we ask you to bring healing into our hearts, to bring healing into the hearts of others, to bring healing into this world. God, we pray that you give us the courage to live boldly for you and your kingdom. God, that you give us the courage to pray those words earnestly. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. And God, as we pursue your will and your kingdom, may you use us as a light to a dark world. May you help us be beacons of truth for people who are hurting and lost and following the wrong things. And so God, we thank you that we don't do this on our own. It's not our efforts, but God, that it is the work that you have done on the cross that saves us, that it is faith in you and you alone that saves us. And we're grateful for that. And we're thankful for that. And so we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Family, I hope you've been encouraged today. I pray that you can find time this week to slow down, to be intentional, to enter into the presence of God who desires to be with you, who wants to be with you, that you will center your lives around him. And as a result, family, that you will be light to a very dark world, a world that needs you to shine Jesus's light. We love you. God bless. And we look forward to being here with you next week as we continue our series, Pray First. It's 
your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. And it's your breath and our lungs. So we Oh 